So I wanted to talk about three conspiracies of the Anthropocene as the introduction this morning. Uh, the first conspiracy that we've been thinking about is the relationship uh, particularly between the idea of the anthropogenic and the idea of the Anthropocene. So if we have uh, maybe hundreds if not thousands of conferences all of which are trying to address the questions of the Anthropocene, the problems of universalism that it presupposes, and the slippery slope uh, of that universalism from a number of critical perspectives. It seems incredibly remarkable that there has never been a discussion in the same way about the idea of the Anthropogenic. So while everyone is particularly concerned about the meaning of the Anthropocene, uh, the idea of anthropogenic change has not uh, produced anywhere near the critical discussion. And so in trying to reflect on why that is, why there have been literally thousands of articles uh, discussing the concern of the Anthropocene and, and actually zero about the idea of anthropogenic change, uh, one of the um, possibilities is that while anthropo the anthropogenic or anthropogenesis is a processual element, the Anthropocene seems to be in some way be definitive. And so this introduces a second kind of conspiracy, we could call it the conspiracy of the humanities. Uh, and in this particular element of the conspiracy, the problem is not so much the naming, but who is doing the naming. And so from the perspective of the arts and the humanities, uh, there is a certain tendency to say how dare geologists and stratigraphers think they can name the meaning of the epoch of the human, uh, something that may have been reserved previously for poets or, or people within the humanities. And so while geologists and stratigraphers themselves have made no claims to say that the definition of the Anthropocene for the purpose of stratigraphic research or geological inquiry is definitive, for the humanities or for any cultural application, there has been a certain uh, overlay between these two elements. And I think what's particularly problematic about this is that the Anthropocene invites a certain rethinking of multidisciplinarity, of hierarchy, of a number of elements um, at stake in the higher education industry, but in the squabbles over naming and the uh, rather limited view about the implications of the Anthropocene, can one publish about it, can it get in one's tenure package, uh, there has been a rather shocking absence of taking up what the Anthropocene has put forward. And so the third uh, conspiracy, so-called, we could call the conspiracy of instantiation. And so while the whole premise of the Anthropocene's criteria scientifically is that it's a planetary global signature, uh, one of the reasons why the atomic signature uh, after the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima is, is, is so uh, promoted as that is because it, that can be detected globally. Um, it is nevertheless always a local instantiation. And, and for this reason we should perhaps not say the Anthropocene, but this Anthropocene, always using the proximal demonstrative in respect to uh, our discussion of it. And so in this Anthropocene of Jakarta, we have used a design office, an academic uh, field research office, a consultancy, and a number of other uh, artistic and curatorial initiatives to try to understand the Anthropocene not as a discourse or an academic fashion, but as a context in which we are all involuntary prisoners. And so, in Jakarta, the instantiation of the Anthropocene revolves around a very particular process that has been underway over the last few years called normalization. And normalization is a way of treating both the urban poor who have been forced here by way of various forms of migration and economic development in the provinces, as well as the river, which uh, runs through the city of 31 million people, into a certain uh, holding pattern or type of confinement which limits their ability to be what they are. 
Normalization in this regard is a process of aesthetic cleansing of the city, removing the messiness of the river and the messiness or apparent messiness of the urban inhabitants in favor of a much more ordered and easy to accumulate process of organization. And so in order to, to sort of elicit some of the conspiratorial elements of this particular Anthropocene, of this instantiation in Jakarta, what we're going to do is take you down the Chiliwang River, the central river uh, of Jakarta, running from the mountains in Bogor to the coast in the north, to give you a sense of the texture of normalization and how that might give us a particularly uh, new reading a material reading, an ecological reading, a, a political economic reading of how the Anthropocene is taking shape in this particular instantiation. So one of the big problems of the relocation, of course, is compensation. So some residents are paid to move. They get paid to demolish their house. Others just get a payout. Some get relocated, but this is really a very ad hoc system. And so trying to understand all of the agencies involved, all of the costs, how do you actually price the normalization? Uh, the World Bank has put a lot of money in for the Jakarta Urgent Flood Mitigation Project. And every time that we ask them, aren't these evictions illegal? They say, absolutely not. The World Bank doesn't pay for illegal evictions. Yet there's absolutely no trace of how that money is being spent. So the responsibility, uh, according to the Jakarta government, falls to the agencies. According to the agencies, it falls to the government. And so there's a lot of evasion in terms of residents, often the urban poor, who are trying to combat these processes but there's just such a tremendous opacity on the side of the government that it's very difficult to determine who to actually confront and where to actually direct those struggles. A lot of people who are going to be displaced here, put into uh, government housing, are ones that were previously using this space uh, informally for their businesses. Um, and so the effects of this in terms of what their livelihoods will be and the need to produce a much larger amount of money for their income to remain in these subsidized houses once the three month of subsidies expires is going to be quite significant. But yet uh, it's kind of strange and remarkable kind of peaceful quiet condition down here compared to the streetscape out in Jadinagara or uh, in many of the areas, the main streets that are on the other side of these houses. So when uh, activists like the Chiliwang Institute and other colleagues who advocate for, uh, instead of a normalization, a restoration of the river, I think a lot of people might still find that a bit idealistic. But passing through the river, if you imagine a more substantial tax on plastic and a f sufficient waste management plan, and an improvement on sanitation, uh, it's very clear that a lot of this could actually be re restored to a fairly comprehensive urban park all the way from Bogor down to the ocean if the government was willing to put the effort in for education, stewardship, and a renewal of uh, a relationship between the river and its residents as opposed to the current plan which is to normalize the river and in effect remove it from the city. Some people have even proposed to put it completely underground so that it would be uh, entirely removed and the residents would no longer have any relationship of any kind. Hello, Bu. So according to some recent presentations that I've seen and uh, colleagues working in sanitation, up to 90% of the wastewater in Jakarta goes untreated into its rivers, reaching the ocean completely untreated. Um, and so we have to wonder at a, one of the highest rates of urbanization in the world with one of the most um, substantial 
contiguous urban footprints, um, what does it mean? What does it mean for the residents of, of Jakarta and Jabodetabek, the megacity? Watch your head, just stay calm. It's gonna come right over you. Uh, what does it mean for 31 million residents to have untreated wastewater all going, going into this river? Now this is a substantial river and it's been raining a lot despite being the dry season. So it's still flowing pretty well and it's particularly clean in that it's been flushed into the ocean. But in the particularly dry moments of the dry season, this can be a pretty uh, awful experience coming down the river uh, because of the amount of sewage that is apparent. Hello, Pa. So you can see a pretty just pretty severe distinction here between people still really using the river in a very sort of traditional way of alongside the river. Watch this big bamboo in the middle, please. And there we go. So on the one side, a sort of people still using this for sanitation, for bathing, for cleaning, despite a pretty di distinct uh, sewage condition. And on the other, we just see this, all of the batons ready to normalize everything that you just saw. You guys, you guys know how to paddle the boat? You want to paddle the boat? So then already in this process, they have to start dredging out the river because as you can see, sediment then builds up on the inside of this curve. Huge amounts of sediment, sediment building up here. And then there's a little break in the normalization. On the other side of this, we'll see that it comes back in. So now in the interim, before it's all completed, we have these sort of strange sediment deposits building up all over. And you'll see as we kind of come through here, you get even a little bit of uh, brown water rafting finally. But trying to keep this completely clean, we'll see as we go down, this dredging's happening the whole way. Now this aggregate material, half sewage, half sediment, is what's being used to build the seawall that we'll see later in the talk. Going a lot faster now. Uh, as a result of this and now as we come in past this last curve now we're we're into normalization on both edges of the river so you'll really get, start to see what was previously upstream pretty green pretty slow pretty quiet uh, really starts to come into the city at this point uh, we have normalization on both edges and really a kind of completely transformed condition uh, at first there's still some trees left uh, in a few minutes that will all be gone and what you end up with is just a sort of concretized sewage channel um, that will that will ride you through to see uh, how some of that normalization is working out. One of the other big issues that to, to start to think about as we see the, the outcome of this normalization in addition to the way that it's changed the river is how can we actually start to understand the cost of this process when we take into account all the forms of maintenance that it implies. Not only the maintenance that the government has to take on about the river, the dredging, uh, the vegetation clearing, the clearing of all of this additional materials, but also uh, all of the maintenance of all of the rusun, all of the housing blocks that people are getting moved into. Uh, as you can see from a lot of the informal housing that was upstream, previously that was really taken care of by the residents uh, on their own in a sort of patchwork incremental style. And now that they've moved into the Rusun, the, the social housing, uh, the government then bears the responsibility uh, of maintaining those buildings. And a lot of those properties, as we'll see, have been uh, pretty poorly maintained already. So already a lot of repairs going on, uh, finishing up the, uh, the job here. You can see in this one, there isn't enough room for the inspection walkway. A uh, little bit of variation in the quality here. 
And then we have uh, one of these big rusuns where a lot of the residents that used to be along the edge have been moved. Uh, you can really see this fairly uh, rough job, we could say. Uh, although you can see that it's been improved a lot since some of the previous trips that we've done down the river. Now you'll notice also that all of these, these holes have been bored in the edge so that we can have some inflow. A lot of residents on the other side of the wall as we come in here to the ma main part of Jakarta have complained that the water is backing up on the other side so it can't properly drain into the river. So here we can really see the comparison of the two edge conditions, the previous edge condition. We have some uh, difficult to formalize housing on the edge here, uh, various qualities, various levels of legality. And then as you see this uh, Kampong edge condition comes to an end. And then we have the beginning of the normalization on this left bank, which on the right bank will, will shows you sort of where that's going. Of course, at the moment it looks a little bit um, little bit suspect in terms of whether this was a particularly good idea. A lot of the batons not really buried so deep. Those will all be hewn down by hand with um, puncture holes so that there's outflow and all of this will be more or less cleaned up. The fate of the houses behind these batons not uh, entirely certain as probably they'll put the push the inspection road back and so a lot of these might either be cleared or in, in effect cut in half. So as we saw upstream a lot of the normalization originally had left uh, staircases for residents to be able to access the river. There are some informal boats as we can see this one is still here uh, to, to ferry people across because very few bridges have been put in. Um, but now you can also notice in the background, start to notice that a lot of these houses have been cut in half. So as the normalization was occurring along this edge uh, and this wall was being put in, uh, a lot of the houses that were deemed to be too close to the right of way to the inspection road which sits on the other side of this concrete uh, were shorn in half by bulldozers. Uh, they still have residents, many of them living inside of them. Uh, their structural uh, efficacy is somewhat uh, dubious, but I think it's it's important to notice that a lot of this um, go ahead that a lot of this uh, normalization has really led to a pretty dramatic uh, reprogramming of the of the urban and social space along the river. Again, you can see on this side now all of this being dredged out all the way to the houses, which you can see are starting to be demolished here. Now a lot of that demolition actually has less to do with the right-of-way and more about clearing the room to put the concrete batons along the edge and to get the crane pulled right up so that that process, uh, which we can see underway here, can take place. You can see here also some of the difficulty of putting this material in place. Just going to get ready here and we're going to have to sort of wiggle our way around this guy. Easy, 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 easy. Oh. I have no idea how we're going to do this. We're going to have to like... I don't... Can you guys, is that just going to be way too low? Can you get to the shore? <laughs> uh, okay, let's get this off. So you can see up here again, we have this whole edge now completely normalized. So they say, uh, you can see that the water level of the river is actually almost at the, the first sort of walking inspection area. And then this large wall closing in the neighborhood on the other side. Now a lot of these neighborhoods that have been closed off from the river, on the one side they can't get the water out when it rains so there are a number of pump trucks stationed along here that the flood prevention has led to all of this concrete being put in so that trucks can permanently sit on the other side and pump the water into the river uh, and until there's proper uh, 
outflow put in here that's that's going to continue but you can also see again uh, particularly just right here on this edge uh, a lot of bags of trash people just tossing over and I think one of the uh, really impressive efforts around stewardship from the Chiliwang Institute and from other colleagues here in Jakarta was to really try to encourage a condition a relationship of stewardship to the river now if you can't see what's on the other side of the wall and if basically we just have a a giant sewage canal. I, I don't see a lot of hope for people maintaining a relationship to the river. You saw back there we just had some bamboo staircases put in because even in this part of the normalization there was no access to the river granted of any kind. A lot of the buildings that had the markings of the flood heights on them have been removed as part of the normalization process. Uh, now on the left side you can still see a tremendous number of residents still occupying the edge of the river uh, right up to its edge. Um, this is also slated for demolition and relocation as part of the normalization plan, um, but the uh, particular dates of that are yet to be determined. So we're coming around the corner here to the Tongtek Bridge. Major outflows here coming in from, from other areas. You can see now all of this was previously residential housing. Hello, Pa! Apakaba! And so we have uh, a lot of construction going on here. We have, uh, you'll see the images of the Tongtek Bridge water actually right at the level of that bridge in 2013 14 and much higher than that uh, in 2007. And so this area on the left, uh, Bukaduri, a kampong now currently facing eviction uh, to complete the normalization on the left side of the river. Uh, a lot of efforts have been made to try to negotiate a kampong improvement situation to move the residents back as opposed to uh, relocate them elsewhere. Uh, but uh, so far those uh, efforts have not been successful. Watch, it's going to get a bit turbulent here. So when we talk about the condition of the Anthropocene, uh, obviously one of the candidates for, for uh, the stratigraphic evidence of that is plastic. The edge condition here along the Chiliwang River gives you a pretty good idea of what the urban soil and the urban settlement of Jakarta is going to look like in a few million years. Just layers and layers of, of disposable plastics um, heaped up from continuous flooding. So this is where we normally stop our infrastructure point of view because after this point there are no water quality readings for the Chiliwong on the other side of the Mangarai lock. For a long time I thought that was very strange, but it turns out that the reason is that there, uh, the substance on the other side of this lock cannot be called water. So it's starting to rain here and we're going to have to wrap it up pulling the boats up. Just catching some fish for lunch, but uh, basically we just came all the way down to the Mangarai Lock, uh, trying to get a sense of the spacing of the normalization. And this point in 1916, the Dutch built this as a key element, not of flood control, but of agricultural hydraulics to help control the um, outflows and make sure that the farmland upstream was getting enough water in the dry season. And only this year was this renovated. I think one of the really most important elements of getting into the infrastructure perspective is being able to understand that the plans of the World Bank, the plans of the Urgent Flood Mitigation Project, and urban planning more generally have been so divorced from the actual course reality of the ground, the difficulty, the resistance of the material ground, that without actually getting an infrastructure point of view, uh, we really can't see the conspiracy for what it is. It was great that you guys joined us down the river. We, we really um I think it's important to get the infrastructure point of view as part of understanding the local instantiation of the Anthropocene. Um, and unfortunately, with the time that we have, we can't show you all of the stuff that we're working on here in Jakarta as a, say, counter normalization, as something that we're really uh, trying to mobilize various diverse communities activist organizations 
uh, community groups and, and even the local government to try to bring a greater interaction and conversation among them. And uh, if you want to check out some of the work that we do, how we're using urban data, how we're trying to bring these elements together uh, with a different approach to the Anthropocene, one that doesn't set normativity as its agenda, but one that tries to appreciate and enhance the diversity of residents and the di diversity of actors, including the river and the city, please check out our work at petajakarta.org. Peta is the Bahasa Indonesian word for map easy to find online and you can check out some of the software we've been developing the platforms that we've been building and i really encourage you to, to have a look at that if you have a chance but thank you so much for your time it was great to bring you down the chili one